We have two speakers, and I'd just like to uh, briefly read a couple of bios. Anne, is it Beeble? Yes. I pronounced it correctly. <clears throat> Anne spent her formative years in Appleton and is a Xavier High School graduate. She left Appleton to attend the University of Minnesota, returned to Appleton for a year of employment with the Outagamie County Historical Society, and eventually settled in the Madison area after completing an advanced degree in architectural history at the University of Wisconsin. Anne has worked in historic preservation since 1995 on projects that included the Wisconsin State Capitol, and the Idaho State Capitol restorations. She founded Cornerstone Preservation in 2006. Since then, the firm has been involved with a number of projects undertaken by the Fox River Navigational System Authority, including the 2006 to 2007 rehabilitation of the four Appleton locks. Currently, Cornerstone Preservation is working in Kakana, assisting with work at locks four and five. Also, Anne is excited about the firm's upcoming involvement in preparing an interpretive master plan for the Fox Wisconsin Heritage Park. Her cohort tonight is Harlan, Harlan Kizo. He's the chief executive officer of the Fox River Navigational System Authority. And I guess he's going to explain to us exactly what that is. At least I hope so. Harlan was hired in 2005 when the authority began operation. As the CEO, he's responsible for overseeing the restoration of the historic locks, the operation and maintenance of the navigational system, and the administration of the agency. Prior to his employment, Harlan was the executive director of the East Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. Through the years, part of his planning efforts involved Fox River Heritage Corridor plans and the negotiation process for transferring the lock system from the Corps of Engineers to the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> Knowing how governments work, I bet that negotiation process could be a lecture all in its own. <laughs> Arlen and Ann, the floor is yours and we thank you. Great, I think I'm gonna be on first. Can, can you hear me without this? It was a little echo back there. Can you hear back here? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go without this. Maybe Anne will, will need it in a minute. If my voice runs out, I'll do that. I doubt it, Harlan. Okay. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm uh, the CEO for the Fox River Navigation Authority. And uh, about, I don't remember how many years ago, but probably sometime, it, it, maybe it was 10 to 15, I spoke to this group over at the library in, in Appleton. We had a meeting over there. And some of you may have been over there. And I think that was at the time when uh, some of the negotiations uh, we're just sort of being finalized as far as the lock system was concerned. And we talked a little bit about the, some of the preservation efforts that Appleton was doing uh, and what was going on with the lock system. Um, again, you, you heard a little bit about my background. Ann and I are going to talk about the Fox River locks, uh, specifically uh, the Appleton lock portion of it, but there's a lot going on on, on the system in, in addition to that. I'm really pleased to be here tonight with all of you. as. Um Stated in the introduction, I grew up in Appleton. This project is really near and dear to my heart. It's been a thrill working with Harlan and the Navigational Authority. Um, the focus tonight is going to be on the locks in Appleton and some things we'd like to talk about. We're going to lead off with how a lock, lock works. As it was mentioned earlier, a lot of people don't even realize there are locks in the community and few, far fewer or less understand how they work because they're most often underwater and then they haven't been used in this area for a couple of decades. We're also going to touch on why the, why, the navigation, why the navigational system is important, but even beyond that, how the Fox River is important as a um, waterway and has been through prehistory. Touching on something that something else that came up in the introduction, um, how did Wisconsin acquire the locks? This is a very interesting story and a very long story. <coughs> I think it's going to give us a nice abbreviated version of that tonight. How have the locks been restored? 
what have we learned through the process of rehabilitation? Uh, and then most, you know, this is significant to the community. How does a restored navigational system benefit your community? What, what can you hope to um, gain from having an active waterway once again? And then as a follow-up, what's next? And then we'll, we'll, we're really going to like having a discussion with you. We have comments and questions at the end. Liz, please. Okay, back we'll, to Harlan. We'll talk a little bit about how does a lock work. And, and people have heard of locks, and you've seen some pictures in time. And you know, around the world, there are locks all over the place as far as uh, 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 the, the placement. And there's old ones and new ones and so forth. Uh, but I don't know how many people have actually been through a lock or how many of you have, have stood at a lock and actually seen it operate and sort of understand what that operation is. And I know there's a few people here. We've had some events where we invited people down. Uh, but basically, the locks here have been around for a long time. We've had a lot of uses on the locks. Uh, and the, 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 as you'll hear, the technology here is, is really old, uh, but still in, in, in a way current because it still works wonderfully. So, next. Uh, Lower Fox River Profile, uh, many of you know, obviously, the water here, you've heard this term about the water flows north, it's the only river and so forth. There are a lot of rivers that go north, but this prominent river, at least in Wisconsin, that, that flows north into Green Bay. Uh, and it has quite a difference in elevation between Lake Winnebago uh, and Green Bay. Uh, we've got like 167 feet of change. Uh, and historically, that was through a series of rapids and, and waterfalls. Uh, and so uh, you'll hear from Anne, it was a little difficult uh, for someone in a canoe or a boat uh, to get from Lake Winnebago to Green Bay because you had to portage all of these, these areas. Uh, but you can see here, most of the drop in the Fox River is in what we call the upper part, from Menasha down to about Tacana. And once we get in the lower river, there's drop down there as well, but it's not nearly as much as we got on the upper part. Uh, and so there's a whole series of dams uh, and, and lots that are required in that portion from, essentially from Appleton to Tacana. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, 39 miles from Winnebago to Green Bay, 160 feet of change in elevation. There are 12 dams. Nine of those are federal, still operated by the Corps of Engineers, and three private dams. We have 17 locks and two, two guard locks. Uh, and we have currently eight locks that are in operational state, but not necessarily all of them actually operate at this point. There were, uh, as part of the federal project, as part of the land that we got, two what are called harbors of refuge on Lake Winnebago at Brothertown and, and uh, Stockton. Uh, and we have a, an aquatic species, species uh, barrier uh, near Wrightstown at, at the Red Crochet Lock. Uh, and we also have about five, waters of, uh, five miles of water frontage and 135 acres of, of property uh, that are in the navigation system at this time. How does a lock work? We've got a series of charts here. But essentially, if we've got a slope in a river, uh, typically, you've got a number of dams uh, that, that capture hydropower and, 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 and so forth, flood control, along these types of rivers where we have slopes. Uh, and if we're going to have passage of boats, uh, they obviously can't go over the dam, so we need a lock. And a lock is simply a container that's got two doors, uh, most of them, there's some that are a little more complex, that have got two doors that you can close. And what you end up doing is if you've got water that's higher on one side, like you would have on a dam, lower on the other side, you allow, uh, you open one set of doors, uh, allow the water uh, to be uh, uh, equalized with that side of the lock, and you drive a boat in. Then you close the doors, uh, and either you let the water out so that the, lock, the boat can come down to the lower level, or if it's coming from the lower side, you let water in from the upper level, raise the boat, open the doors, and let it out again. So it's a gravity type situation. Very simple process that's been used for years and years and years, and even the modernized locks now that you've got that you push a button and so forth to make this happen, use that same principle. So it's a very, very sound engineering type of principle. So again, there are valves that allow this water to go through and drain out and open and close, and that's what changes the water height in the lock. So why did the Fox locks matter? What is the historical content here that's so compelling that um, 
makes the restoration of the locks and the revitalization of the waterway so, I don't know, desirable. And can you use the microphone? Okay. How's that? Better? Okay. Um, the Boston Sands Waterway was a very early territorial transportation route um, that was key to the settlement of, of the territory of Wisconsin and later the state of Wisconsin. Prior to that, it was a, a really important Native American route. Next slide, please, Liz. In fact, um, the Native American and uh, French explorer slash border trader culture was very rich in this area, in part due to Charles Greeno. Here's a house before it was restored, owned by the uh, owned by the city of Quantico, correct? Had been in the property of the Autonomous Historical Society for many years. And it is, is it a beautiful restored state just across the road from the Conalog 4, so that's a very nice setting. Um, Charles Reno was involved in um, not only doing fur trade for many, many years with the Native Americans in the area, but when it came time to some sort of move them out, he was involved in establishing some of the treaties with the Menominee. Next slide, please. So the, the river, we have to really be cognizant of the folks that, that enjoyed its um, riches prior to Euro-American culture settling in. So part of the story and something I'm looking forward to learning more about and looking at the interpretive plan is, is the story of Native American culture in this area. The land sessions, and you see the map, it, was, it occurred very quickly between about 1927 and 1948 that most of the Native Americans moved out of this area and then the eventual assimilation of Native Americans um, further west around reservations in the state. There are some really beautiful stories about um, the, the, the community in Little Sheep that had a, 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 a Catholic uh, missionary involved in the uh, life there, had, you know, as a missionary to the Indians. He was very sad when, when his Native Americans were, were sent to the west. And, it was at that point he went to Holland and brought the little shoe, I mean the Dutch over the little shoe. Next slide, please. So, as soon as the Native Americans were out, you know, the property was available for sale. That's largely was the end result. Um, people, the U.S. government owned the property, it could, it could give it out and it could sell. So, the development of blocks was, um, a lot of people had talked about an equitable waterway and how valuable it would be to settle in commerce, but it was Morgan L. Martin from um, Green Bay that really got things going and headed up the company that made the initial, did the initial work. Um, he was so proud of his efforts that he commissioned a pair of English artists who were in the Green Bay area. Um, Martin and Stevenson? No, I'm sorry. Brooks and Stevenson, thank you so much. To do a series of paintings illustrating the locks that had just been completed. These were done in and these are really fascinating images. They show um, the two locks of what was then called Grand Chute. And the image on the left is the lower lock, which would be in the vicinity of Appleton Lock 1. And on the right, you see, um, no, I'm sorry, Appleton. The lower lock is in the vicinity of Appleton Lock 4. And the image on the right is um, the upper lock, which would be in the vicinity of Appleton Lock. So, with the navigational features in place, they not only allowed um, the influx of travelers, and not travelers so much, but settlers, their goods, their household items, and back to them. It's an interesting story that the materials used to construct the Reno House were actually brought in by barge from New York State. So, it was really, really key to the settlement of the state and then the eventual growth of industry, particularly in the Appleton area. And Appleton was um, very prominent on the waterway for having four locks and the development industry that occurred around those. So I just have assembled a, a collection of images that I, I think are interesting that really highlight the locks in Appleton. The bird's eye view is from a, um, a graphic prepared in the late 1870s and um, this is, this is a crop 